Professor Miri, I greet you in the framework of our project, City of the Classroom. Professor Miri, as an expert in medieval and early modern history, your research focused on the social and religious history of European between 1100 and 1500. Could you share with, with us your viewpoint on the role of the religion in medieval cities and how it influenced formation of Middle Ages cities? Well, I think a useful way of thinking about religion in this period is that in a way it's the only game in town. That is to say, it's the framework that organizes most life for most people. That does not mean to say that people believed everything, nor that they were particularly good Christians according to the rules of Christianity, nor indeed that they understood the deep theology of Christianity always very well. But it is the expected framework for life. And those who were not Christians are perceived and treated as exceptions, as problems, as subjects to perhaps be converted to Christianity, or indeed groups that have to be kept quite excluded from aspects of civic life. But having said that, the majority of the population in most cities, say from the year 1000 to 1500, were indeed Christian. In Central Europe, that Christianity may include uh, groups like Armenian Christians or indeed uh, Byzantine Greek Christians and various forms because there is migration from further east into Central European cities. So, and, and often such groups would have a privilege to worship in their own tradition, not necessarily in the Roman version that is common for West and most of Europe as we think of Europe today. So how does this uh, uh, organize, how does this contribute to religious life? Well, um, first we have to look at the landscape or at the cityscape and the tallest buildings are likely to be the spires of, or the towers, or the bell towers in Italy, the campanile of churches. So it's the visibility. And buildings associated with the church are buildings built in stone. They are durable. In a period where in large parts of Europe, buildings were built of wood and other types of less durable materials. And the church, or some of the churches of a city, may well be very, very ancient buildings too, even going back to the Roman periods, we're talking fourth, fifth centuries, which makes them even more important in terms of their symbolic value for the city, okay? Now, some cities have the privilege of being cathedral cities, cities that are also the center of administration of a the church's administrative unit, which is called a diocese. So uh, there would be a bishop in one great church in that city, and that bishop would himself be a, a quite significant individual, not only in the church, but usually also in terms of the politics of the state. And that building would be a center that maybe attracts pilgrims who come from other parts in order to visit the tomb of a saint or to see some relics. That uh, cathedral uh, would have very elaborate and particularly beautiful uh, ceremonies and rituals for the festivities so people would come to see them. The bishop has a, a lot of property so the church would be so the cathedral church would be decorated in a style that's particularly magnificent compared for example with parish churches so those cities that and there are hundreds of them across europe that were also cathedral cities in them that religious aspect would be particularly particularly enhanced but even beyond the cathedral in a city or indeed in towns and smaller towns that did not have cathedrals, the, the presence of churches is really important because the idea is that every Christian belongs from cradle to grave to a parish, a parish where he or she are well known, where they receive their sacraments from their birth, their baptism to their burial, etc. So that this framework, it's almost like a neighborhood framework. 
And because a lot of labor in the Middle Ages is organized in neighborhoods, you have the street of the shoemakers and the street of the carpenters and the street of the dyers and so on, you often get a really interesting overlap between being members of a parish and being living together in the same profession. So you start getting this overlap between labor, sociability, religion, so that religion comes to encompass more than simply some sort of preoccupation with uh, spiritual things. It's about social practices. The person you work with, the person you do business with, the person uh, you have to trust in your, in your work life may also be sitting next to you or rather standing, because they didn't sit in churches at the time, standing next to you uh, in the church. And added to that, what is taught within the churches uh, in terms of sermons, sermons that are delivered every, every Sunday, but also sermons that are well attended on feast days, could be messages that really have quite an important, we might call political or ethical component, the duty of those who have to give to those who do not have, uh, how to behave, how to participate, whether you support the, law, the a war or, or some other initiative in politics or not. So again, because it's a gathering of people, it cannot but have a sort of political resonance to it. Thank you so much. In your book, Corpus Christi, you research later medieval culture through its central symbol, the Eucharist. In your opinion, what is the purpose of this symbol? That's a great question. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting question. What is the purpose indeed? Well, um, the Eucharist, that is the ceremony, the mass, the ceremony, during which is reenacted uh, Christ's own gesture as it's described in the scriptures uh, on the Thursday before he died, on Maundy Thursday before he died, he had the supper, which is the Passover supper. It's actually the Jewish ritual that he celebrated with his disciples, but at which when he gestured to the bread and to the wine of the ceremony, he actually used that as a metaphor for what is coming. His death, his resurrection, and the need to remember him. This is my body. This is my blood. So it would have been possible to simply say that Christians remember this, and so they did in the first centuries. But as Christianity got more and more established in the earlier medieval centuries, say between 500 and 1000, certain practices uh, um, turned that mention in scripture into something more systematized. It was commented upon. Uh, uh, theologians tried to interpret it. What does it really mean? What did he really mean? Bread can't be flesh and wine can't be blood. So there was a lot of debate as to what this really means. But um, after the year 1000, a lot of the theological discussions that in earlier centuries took place mostly in monasteries and amongst the professional religious, these debates turned into a, a blueprint, a, a sort of a plan for a Christian life that might be brought to many, many, many more people. So there is a process after the year 1000 of attempting to educate religiously uh, more people, and ultimately within the parish system itself. So everything is sort of passed down through the parish. So in a way through an educated priest, and I'm not saying that all priests were properly educated, but the, the blueprint, the ideal model is that there is a sort of trickle down of Christian understanding. And that even if people cannot all be theologically sophisticated, what they can definitely be is recipients of sacraments. Now, what is a sacrament? A sacrament, its definition is a material sign of internal grace. It's some procedure that you can see in the world that actually represents something much, much more spiritual and special, the grace, the grace of salvation that came to the world with Christ's incarnation. So that 
there's a package of sacraments that is now conveyed much more rigorously, much more regularly to many, many millions of Europeans through the parish system. Now, these people aren't expected to understand every intricacy of Christian religion, but certain beliefs become absolute sine qua non. You must believe them to be a Christian. And indeed, this ceremony, this mass became such a belief. If you're a Christian, you have to believe, believe that in the world, there are sacraments that were instituted by Christ that don't just commemorate, that re-enact his very own action. And if he intimated in the bread and wine is his flesh and blood, that is what you should believe that you're getting when the priest puts the bread and wine of the mass, the consecrated bread and wine into your mouth. Now, this is a big ask. This isn't easy at all, but it's very, very powerful. The idea that you can come to this sort of intimate closeness with your savior. So a lot of effort, if you look at books for priests, if you look at theological writings, if you look at sermons, if you look at plays, if you look at religious stories, a lot of material is created by Christian intellectuals in order to convey, to convince in simple terms with great stories, with great examples that this is really happening. It's tough. If it was easy, it would, everyone would believe it. It's tough to believe it, that you are receiving Christ's body, his flesh and blood into you once a year when you go to mass at Easter and you actually receive his body. So in that sense, this symbol, within this symbol are almost folded within it, everything that Christianity wants to teach. Incarnation, that, that the Christian God is a God that actually took on human flesh and looked during his lifetime like you and you and you and you, and hence can also offer this, this salvation to humans that has never been offered before. So that's the idea. And um, it becomes a central symbol, which of course, therefore, it's not surprising that when the Reformation comes in the 16th century and afterwards, this was a very contentious issue. Uh, Martin Luther himself had a different interpretation. This is something more of a memorial of Christ's uh, of Christ's life rather than a reenactment, but Calvinists and others would totally reject this. It doesn't stand to reason. What does it mean? A priest stands at the altar and he summons God's body. How can that be? But for a number of centuries and definitely in, until our day in the Catholic tradition, it's a very, very, very powerful symbol. And, and the purpose is to really convey the enormity, the extraordinary nature of, 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 of Christian promise, of what Christianity can offer that no other religion ever dared to say it could. Thank you so much. Professor Mili, in your opinion, what is the place of symbolism in cities? How symbolism in cities influence people? Well, symbolism is using something to stand for something else. That is what symbolism, that's how it works. So um, in cities, you see symbols everywhere and particularly symbols of that rather unique quality of urban life that we might call the civic. A realm where people uh, organize themselves, um, I mean, there's often an authority above them. There's the King of England, the King of France, but nonetheless, in English or French cities, there is some realm of relative autonomy where townspeople organize themselves, uh, do stuff in a collaborative fashion. Uh, in Italian cities at the time where there was a particularly high level of, um, uh, of uh, independence in the 12th, 13th, even 14th centuries, uh, we even use the word republicanism. That is to say, literally, uh, the, 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 all the business that pertains to the public sphere is in the hands of townspeople. They elect officials. Now, of course, 
uh, the richer are more influential, the people who have skills in the law, in medicine, in administration will be more active, of course. But nonetheless, it is a realm of interaction that's public. So how do you convey that this is the case? You convey it by building civic buildings, town hall, the Rathaus that you get in every German town, even small ones, right? Uh, you do it by building, by building tall and impressive towers. You definitely do it by circling your city with walls that even if nobody's going to invade you, nonetheless, that wall represents the, what's within is a unit. It matters. And this goes back to Aristotle. Aristotle conceived as the city, as indeed walled, a walled assembly of people who live together according to rationality, he said. That is to say, they reflect, they try to do the right thing. There is some sphere of civic interaction that is, uh, stands to reason because there are laws, there's regularity. There's an attempt to do the right thing. And so how do you, so this is at one level very practical. You have officials, you have offices, you have taxes, mm -hmm. but like all things, it touches people very often and, and persuades them to take part and to believe in it through symbols. Now these symbols can be, as I said, civic or even secular in nature. Um, but uh, building a piazza, for example, a piazza, a place for people to gather, like in Siena, for example, the, 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 the campo, where, where people gather, just the ability to create that space allows the experience of gathering and of civic participation to take place right in front of the Palazzo Publico with its wonderful uh, tall tower. But interestingly, and here Siena is a very good example, because religion was so pervasive and because religion was so influential and because religion had so many uh, uh, cultural resources at its disposal, of course, civic institutions also availed themselves of uh, religious symbols. And Siena is a wonderful example because Siena dedicated itself to the Virgin Mary. So after a great, for example, a great, um, a great battle in 1260, when Siena won its uh, independence from Florence, they immediately commission images and ceremonies to the Virgin Mary in order to say, yes, we are protected, we are virtuous, we are good, and we will continue to flourish because our city is not just a hardworking city that manufactures stuff that people want to buy, etc. It is also a virtuous, in the Christian sense, city. And indeed, the whole rebuilding of the cathedral, the Duomo, which is dedicated to the Virgin Mary, is done as a civic project. And the, a, a certain style is developed of art in Siena, which is uh, very powerful. And very often the people who request the, um, these works of art are the people who run the city. That is, it's the officials who are the patrons of the art which is the symbolic, obviously, the symbolic decoration uh, of, of the city. So that's quite interesting. Also at a lower, even at a, at a much more mundane level, um, officials had outfits. Every neighborhood in Siena, Siena, every contrada, because these neighborhoods still exist and they compete against each other in the summer in, in, in um, horse races, very famous horse races, have their own colors, have their own flag. So even within the city, which is largely a community, there are sub-communities which symbolize their membership through a lot of visuals. There was a lot of visual stimulation in medieval cities, which obviously gave jobs to uh, craftspeople, to artists, to carpenters, to all the people who put it on.
Thank you so much. In the book, Church and City, 1011-1500 essay in honor of the Christopher Brook, you consider it urban life and religious life of that period. If we imagine a city as a university that influences people at different levels, in your opinion, in which ways people are impacted by cities through social and religious aspects? Yes, um, I should just mention that the book that you cited is not a book written by me, but it's a book where a number of us came together to offer articles in honor of a very, very great medievalist, Christopher Brook, who is sadly not with us anymore. He was my teacher and, and with a colleague, we put this together. But you're right. I love the idea of the city as a classroom. I mean, one might also say a village is a classroom in as much as every community has to socialize its young into, into the proper mode of behavior expectations. But the city is particularly so. And the reason is this, that um, the city becomes home to people who are not from there. There is a high proportion of newcomers, of immigrants, of officials, who, who, who professionals, merchants, people maybe who are just passing through, maybe just for a while, and you mentioned university, if it's Paris or if it's Montpellier, if it's Bologna, if it's Padua, if it's Cambridge, if it's Oxford, you have these students who come for a number of years and then they go. So while they're there, it's important that the city educate them about the norms, the local norms, the local expectations from them. So, you know, if you have a student who comes from Modena to Bologna, okay, more or less, this student knows what urban life is like in Italy, and you can adapt. But people came from further afield, and, and the city was visited and indeed entered into as new residents by people who came from much further afield. So this element of educating the newcomer is interesting. One way they did it was by regular proclamation of their statutes, of their rules for life. Once a year, on a certain day, the rules of the city are read out. Okay, so that's not very frequent. A city like Verona decided to have its rules, its statutes actually inscribed on the facade of its cathedral. So it's always there. People can read them. A city like Siena translated its rules, its statutes, into the vernacular, from the Latin, into the language that is spoken locally. So ordinary people can go and consult and find out about the local rules. But this again, it's asking people to do a lot. I think probably people learned most about, or, or, or were educated in the classroom of the city by being integrated into um, meaningful social groups. What I mean is, if a wife comes from another city and marries a local merchant, that merchant will educate her perforce in what you do or you don't do in his family or in his city. If you come to work and you join a guild, a group of workers in a certain craft, again, it's your peers who will educate you as to what's acceptable or not. If you come and um, any group that you join will have to, and the reason they will have to do so is that in this medieval, this pre-modern society, every person who comes from elsewhere into a city has to have a guarantor, has to have somebody who says, I'm responsible for this person. I mean, actually, it's a little bit like a sponsor for an immigrant in, in, in our contemporary life. Somebody who can say, I know their character, but except in the Middle Ages, this had legal, uh, really very strongly legally binding this was because you would have to pay the fine if somebody broke the law for whom you stood as guarantor. So there is, so suppose you've hired somebody to work in your workshop. It's in your interest to help them settle and understand the local parameters of social life. No, here we don't spit in the street. Maybe in a different city you do. Here on the whole, we don't whistle after women. It's common in other places. Here, we don't 
throw rubbish in the street. I mean, all these different conventions of different communities that really are very different from different places. That's a sort of thing that's a very interesting process. And I thank you very much for asking this because it's quite an interesting thing to reflect upon. How do you become a local? But in all the statutes of the cities, it is understood that it's a process. It's a process. It takes time for someone to become a real local resident. So if you're born in the city, it happens from the day you were born, you become naturalized into the city, just like in a village. But if as so many town dwellers were, you come from elsewhere, it, it, it is a, a, a more accelerated process and one which, uh, in which your peer group and those who support you have to play a crucial role. Otherwise, they'll be ending up paying your fines 